Good afternoon, actually good morning. Got another beautiful day in Virginia, I love it. Colorado Avalanche lost last night, but we'll somehow find a way to deal with it. Good morning from Virginia, the Don't Unfriend Me show. My name is Matthew Spear, I'm the host of Don't Unfriend Me, and I started doing this show a couple years ago. And uh, we've just recently kind of moved out of the office and started doing these on the patios, a little more of a uh, informal, impromptu show. Once in a while, I get a viewer who reaches out who wants to debate me or wants to uh, have the, uh, the trading of barbs in text through social media. I, I don't do it. Um, written form of communication I enjoy when I can take a few minutes and collect my thoughts. But I, I like to do a lot more expose, off the cuff, not a lot of preparedness. And, and the reason why is because I think human nature is to cloak ourselves in statistics and other people's arguments versus um, having our own abilities uh, come to the forefront. So I will make this video because it was a good topic and it's something that I think is interesting and it's predicated on yesterday's conversation about socialism. And uh, the gentleman said, well, I want to debate you. And I said, great, come on the show at eight o'clock tonight. And of course, nothing but crickets. So I will have this uh, conversation and debate now. 1950, we hear about it all the time. Hey, the 1950s, is such a great time economically. The tax rate was 90, 91%. Everybody could have one job and a blue collar job, whether it be a plumber or working in the oil fields or uh, working at a fast food restaurant. They could afford their own house and a, a new car and a full family of four. And this really is not true. Not true compared to today's standards because folks, we need to put things in perspective. And the first thing we should put in perspective is that in 1950, the houses were much smaller. They didn't have smart systems. They weren't pre-wired for internet and fiber optic and cable. They weren't insulated the same way. They were extremely thick and dense. They had uh, more opportunities for repairs to happen because they were necessarily um, built to last, of course, but with that came a lot of issues that technology is taking care of. For instance, siding or uh, roofing that lasts 50 years versus five or 10 years back in the day. Uh, water heaters that broke down, um, not because they weren't built to last, but because problems do happen. And technology has made things better and worse as we understand that a vacuum cleaner maybe lasts a couple years now where the one that my mother was using was from my grandmother. So there's a trade-off here. Technology makes life easier and sometimes more difficult. But what you can assure is that houses are more efficient from an energy perspective. Windows are better. Uh, roofing is better. The overall construction, drywall, material, all of these things have increased. But with that, the cost has gone up because it's expensive. Things inside windows, for instance, butyl rubber is an invention that has patents. Those patents cost money. So when you buy a Martin window versus a Polte, or you buy a Martin window versus some cheap uh, knockoff at Home Depot, there's going to be a variance in price. And unfortunately, that pays off to the consumer. So in 1950, you didn't have air conditioning. That's another thing that you got to consider. You didn't have alarm systems. You didn't have the smart home system. You didn't have all the wiring that I talked about. So as we've seen that not only have these houses gotten bigger, for instance, four people live in this house. You can see the one behind me. It's giant. This is a 5,000 square foot behemoth and so is mine. Well, 1950, that's not what you saw. People's appetites for more has obviously increased the cost of getting more. Something to think about. Let's look at cars. Man, these, these vehicles in 1950, there were more steel and more weight and size in these gas guzzlers than 10 cars today. And the reason why is because that's the way they were built back then. The engines were extremely large. They took a huge amount of power to push these things, which meant tires were, were worn down. They had to make them thicker and more dense. But as technology has gone on, we've made cars lighter and maybe, well, dare I say, safer than they were in the yesteryear. But with that comes airbags and seat belts and SRS systems for braking and technology and everybody wants the latest and greatest DVD player and they want it to park itself and drive itself. Once again, the needs of the consumer have increased. Therefore, the innovation and technology and the dollars have passed on to the consumer. My parents bought their first house for $11,000. You couldn't even find a decent uh, economic valued base car like a Kia 
or a Yugo for $11,000. When you're looking at also vehicles and houses, but look at vacations. I mean, we used to pack into the car and drive eight hours to, to Disneyland or drive to Vegas or the Grand Canyon. Now, all expense paid trip. You wanna go to Barbados and go to Cancun and you wanna go to Turks and Caicos. You wanna get on a Disney cruise. Well, these things are tens of thousands of dollars. The simplicity of the yesteryear of what entertained people is not the same today. It's much different. Where maybe for 4th of July, you decided to get a couple sparklers and some snakes on the ground and get some barbecue ribs or some chicken, and that was 4th of July. Now 4th of July has to be a reenactment of Arthur Fiedler and the Great Orchestra and watching giant fireworks shows that cost millions of dollars or going to a Yankees game and watching the 4th of July show or Disneyland. These things obviously cost a lot of money. You can also take a look at things like medical care. Well, Medical care used to be something simple. You'd make a phone call and the doctor would come over with his little black bag, stethoscope, tongue depressor, and thermometer, one for here and one for down there. And well, actually one for here and one for down there. The oral thermometer came later. It was more expensive, mind you. Once again, more money for things like that. But it, it was a one-stop show. Now you have MRIs and now you have specialists for the simplest of things. Not just an ear, nose, and throat doctor, but endocrinologists. You've got uh, people who are responsible for taking care of certain parts of the body as far as bone density and muscle mass and fatty tissue and, and people who need uh, elective surgery versus surgery that's necessary. The tests alone, I mean, this costs an ungodly amount of money and with a quality of health care that keeps expanding, the prices continue to go up. Listen, I'm not saying it's fair. I'm not saying that it's uh, it's okay for, for the consumer to be price gouged like this, but if the consumer wasn't willing to pay for these things, then, well, these things wouldn't be around. The next thing you gotta also consider besides that complexity is college. I mean, college really hasn't increased. Knowledge has expanded and we are becoming overclassified in certain degrees, but really college is the same thing. It's based upon the current stasis of information and you wanna transmit or disseminate that from one to another. That process is not more difficult. That process has relatively remained the same. In fact, I would dare I would say with computers and innovation once again increasing for a low cost of investment from these universities, it should be easier today to teach than it was back then. In fact, take a look at colleges and institutions and the way they teach. If you wanted to see an atomic explosion in 1950, uh, you're not talking about the ease of use that it is today, simply because you may have to close and imagine that in that time period, but you actually had live footage and you have computer models and you have data that comes back and real life scenarios where you can study that. How about open heart surgery? You would have to perform it on a frog and dissect that. Well, now you can actually see it live and in person with fiber optics and cameras. Teaching today, although more complex in the sense of what the kids are learning, the ease of being able to teach that because of the tools that have been created are a lot easier. College isn't more expensive because it's harder to teach or innovation hasn't kept up. It's more expensive because predatory lending because people are taking out loans that they can't afford. They can't take out loans on the TV set. They can't take out these giant loans on a brand new Tesla. They can't afford the $4.75 for a cup of coffee, so they're constantly living beyond their means. And what once would pay for a modest house and a car and a family of four is no longer the prescription that's necessary in order to keep up with the Joneses. You have to spend more. Let's take an example. Let's look at your TV set. You would have to buy a TV set for $179 back in the day. I'm just guessing, 1950. And you would pick the rabbit ear antennas and put them up and you would get a select five or six channels. Well, that was fantastic. Everyone was happy and they were amazed that the man in New York could be seen in the, by the man in Atlanta. But the interesting thing that happened is that they started to do new innovation like color and remote controls. And then people wanted more selection. Now they want 475 channels with quadraponic blaupunks and subwoofers that will blow your doors off like you're watching Star Wars in the Chinese theater. This, once again, is a perfect example. So you get all that and you buy your Blu-rays or you buy your DVDs or your VHS tapes. And then the technology is obsolete, so you upgrade to new innovations like digital or Blu-ray like I had mentioned. But then you ask her something else. 
At that point, you say, well, I want not just the ease of use of getting the movies that I loved in the theater or reminiscing of when I was a child, I want instant gratification, so I want Netflix. And then I want Amazon Prime, because I can't miss that. Then I want the Disney Channel. Then I want ESPN. So we bought cable and all of this other stuff, and then we expanded into over-the-top programming because we wanted to save money on our $300 cable bill, but now we're spending $300 on standalone a la carte services. Don't you see the necessity that we had in the 1950 was to provide food. Hopefully our kids would go to college or help them strive for that next level job that was more than mom and dad made. And it was a simpler, easier time where people were not necessarily looking for that next level experience of, of having the most amazing life possible with the biggest front yard and the nicest car and the highest education and check off their, their boxes on how many countries they traveled to expectations have consequence and more importantly have a cost attached to them and that's what you're seeing and listen i don't mean to be uh encroaching upon a topic that's sensitive but 1950 there's one thing that that people don't want to admit and, and this is the honest to god truth i grew up with my mom i know what she did certainly not 1950 but i know what her mother did is you had a woman at home cooking cleaning going to the grocery store uh, ensuring that the clothes were, were ironed and washed and ready to go or washed back in the day. The value of what women do from a matriarch perspective helps households be successful. You don't have to pay for a maid. You don't have to pay for daycare. You don't have to pay for a nanny. You don't have to keep your kids in constant sports because you're there to teach them things that ultimately we've handed off to schools and secondary care. That is an amazing amount of money. The tax breaks you get for having um, and fi filing jointly and having someone who stays home and you can claim them as a dependent also helps. My wife stays home. It saves us thousands of dollars, thousands and tens of thousands of dollars a year having her doing the things that we would have to outsource financially. Let's be transparent. The feminist movement was an amazing thing. It's important, but it also had an impact on the nuclear family and the basic makeup of the patriarch, patriarch and matriarch hierarchical system inside of a household. Now you have two people who want to work, which creates more income, but allows these companies and all of the, 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 the lenders and the people who supply us our digital cable and, and food costs and gas and cars to increase prices because you make more. That's what companies do their job isn't to give you benefit it's to go ahead and take your money because that's what a full profit society and a free market is it's really important to understand that 1950 is not what it is today and that is probably one of the biggest factors and this is the honest to god truth and most people who are my age understand this the more you make the more you spend and corporations know this if we go ahead and we take a look at the tax rate, this is the big one, that all the rich people in 1950 paid 90% taxes. This is a complete misnomer. Taking a look at this graph and breaking it down, the 91% bracket of 1950 only applied to households with income over $200,000, or about $2 million in today's dollars. Only a small number of taxpayers would have had enough income to fall into the top bracket, fewer than 10,000 households, according to the Wall Street Journal. Even among households that did fall into the 91% tax bracket, the majority of their income was not necessarily subject to that top bracket. After all, the 91% bracket only applied to income above $200,000, not to every single dollar earned by households. Finally, it's very likely that the existence of a 91% tax bracket led to significant tax avoidance and lower reported income. Many studies show that as a marginal tax rates rise, income reported by taxpayers go down. As a result, the existence of the 91% tax bracket didn't necessarily lead to significantly higher revenue collections from the wealthy. When you look at taxes and what it does for a society, what we've learned throughout history is that there is no such thing as taxing yourself into prosperity. Every single country has tried it at one time or another, from kings and nobles to 
the, the, the Attila the Hun thug trying to go ahead and get an extra sheep or a bag of rice. Taxing a country into prosperity has never taken place. The only thing that truly brings a country into prosperity is free market capitalism. We've shown this, we've demonstrated this, and we've seen this across the world. Specifically, take a look at Sweden and Norway, who th people think are a socialist country, and they're absolutely far from it. In fact, they tell you, don't call us socialists, we're not. We have social programs, and there is a very big difference. The United States has a ton of social programs, but our overarching way of doing economic trade and how we go ahead and prosper as a country is through capitalism, is through the middle class and the upper class, but it has to be specifically invested in and created, which means regulation throttles the middle class. Maybe as a society, we shouldn't be looking backwards to 1950s. We should be looking today at what we spend in our checkbook, how much we put on credit cards and how much we leverage not just our futures, but emulate the U.S. government that leverages all of us into debt at a tone of $172,000 per taxpaying American. And maybe if we truly want to take a look at where we are today and how do we get back to 1950, folks, there's a lot of people on this planet and there's a lot of people in the United States who have no desire to go back to 1950. It wasn't the best of times, worst of times. It had a lot of things that we don't want to go back to. Folks, if we want to go ahead and simplify this, 1950 was not a more complex time. It's just like it is today. People had to work hard. People went through difficult times. People had debt back then. It wasn't what you think. They just tried to not live beyond their means. They didn't put things all on a credit card, and when they went to the bank, it was a last resort, not the first thing that they thought of. My dad told me a long time ago, if you can't pay it with cash, you can't afford it. So don't put it on credit and a credit card unless it's a house or a car. I've tried to stick to that, and there were times that I went into debt and tried to live beyond my means, and now, dare I say, I've learned that lesson. I would ask us, instead of going back and looking at 1950 and trying to figure out how we get back to that, maybe we should look at 2023, 2030 and beyond and say, maybe, just maybe, it's not about getting back to 1950, it's learning to be happy where we are and looking forward to where we will be with hard work, dedication, and a little bit of discipline. Folks, that's it. Thank you for watching the Don't Unfriend Me show. I appreciate you watching. If you like the show, you can follow me at The Dumb Show, or you can go ahead and listen to us on all podcasts at The Dumb Show as well, or go to thedumbshow.com to get some cool shirts. Still Point is playing in Georgia. They are the Don't Unfriend Me band. Go listen to them. They are amazing and good friends of the show. You can find them, S-T-I-I-L-P-O-I-N-T. -I -I and if you look them up at Ticketmaster, you can get tickets yourself to the show. Please go do that. And I will see you tonight at 8 o'clock with a new live show. God bless. Thank you for watching the Don't Unfriend Me show.